Okay. If you would open your hymnals to page 301. Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, thou art welcome. And if you would read with me Philippians 4, verses 4 through 8, it goes like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to him. Peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is anything excellent, and in anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it is an amazing thing that the creator, the omnipotent, uh, infinite, personal God stops to uh, hear us come to you. Father, we pray that we pester you all day long as we are instructed to do. Father, we pray that uh, you will be with Michael's brother. We pray that you will be with uh, young Judah, that you will build him to be a warrior for you and have him be healthy and strong in every way give his parents great wisdom. This is maybe the greatest learning experience that any couple goes through. And the the books are many and the training is scant. Father, we pray for our community. We pray that we will be a light, that we will impact our community in the most positive of ways, that we will not grumble but we will reflect you accurately as we have been uh, talking about the coin, the denarius that belongs to the nations. We want to be the coin that belongs to you. And just by being there, they can see who we are and who we belong to. Father, uh, give us the energy to proclaim you loudly and boldly. Give us the knowledge and the desire to spend the time in your word to know you intimately and to be able to represent you accurately. Father, we thank you that you have put us in an amazing community in the lap of luxury. And Father, have us use these things to your glory, not to our own comforts. Father, we pray that you will bless our local representatives, the city council, our uh, mayor. We pray for our governor and our representatives in Colorado, that they will all be righteous in thought, that they would be accurate in thinking, and they will honor you in the way that they conduct their lives and the way that they uh, make decisions remembering that they are servants to do our bidding. 
Father, we pray this too on the national basis. Uh, we seem to have a real point of confusion in our nation. And Father, we pray that you will make it right and that we will once again be one nation under God. Father, together we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive those who sin against those who sin against us. It's not a temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you, would, if you would open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the first chapter, starting at verse 43. And John says, the next day, he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, a city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Daniel answered and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him and said, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open, the angels of God descending, excuse me, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And may God add his blessing to his word. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It is uh, so good to, to see you. Uh, it's been a blessing being able to come and Rick and I being able to come and take not only the, the book of Acts, but also the book of Genesis and flip-flop those every Sunday. You know, and then there's a reason why we're doing that, because as we uh, started in Genesis with Church Church, and now we're in Genesis 28 today. And Eus is also uh, was looking through and still uh, looking through the book of Acts. So on one Sunday we hit Genesis, on another Sunday we hit the book of Acts. So today we're looking at Act, we're looking at Genesis the 28th chapter, the 28th chapter Genesis so if you would turn there with me to that I'm gonna I'm gonna read through that entire chapter and then I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to think about something I'm gonna ask you to think about something when it comes to heaven coming to earth heaven coming to earth uh, do you know that you can experience heaven right now? Heaven coming to earth. Why is it that when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As what? As in heaven 
on earth. Now, Jesus didn't give him that prayer just because he had nothing else to fill up that moment with. He was basically making a statement about the reality of experience in heaven right now. But we're going to be looking at this guy by the name of Jacob. And you're going to see a picture of what Jesus is talking about in Genesis 28 all the way into John to what Peter just so gracefully read. And the question to you today is, are you experiencing heaven on earth? Are you experiencing that? And you know what? You can. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our time this morning. Is that okay with you? Because if I, I want to slow this one down because I want you to understand that if anything should be happening to the church today, the church should be reflecting heaven on earth. Are you with me on that one? Should be. It should be easy to do in a dark world. Should be easy to do. But let's do this here. Let's take, Gen let's take Genesis 28, and we're going to read about this guy by the name of Jacob, okay? And we're going to look at him all the way from verse 1 to verse 22. But I want to read it to you so you can get the big picture, because I'm going to do three things this morning. I'm going to tell you what it's saying, and then I'm going to tell you who it's talking to, and then I'm going to tell you how you apply it to your life today. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. So here we go. Genesis 28. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Cana. Arise and go to Pandarama, Pandaram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there, take yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Pandaram, to Laban, the son of Bethul, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, and Esau. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pandaram, a, to, 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 to take to himself a wife from there, and that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Cana. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Pandam Aram. So Esau saw the daughters of Cana, displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to Ishmael and married because the wives that he had, besides the wives that he had, he married Mahalath the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haram, and he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place and he put it up under his head, and he laid down in that place. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth, with the top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land to which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in the descendants shall be all the families. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob awoke from the sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. 
And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. And he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously, the name of the city had been loose. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, I return, and, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house. And of all that thou thus give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. Let's pray. Father, we ask that this word today about Jacob will come to us in a personal way. And that, Father, we can apply that today. That just like you spoke to Jacob, you can speak to us and we can experience it in a personal way. So we ask that you would open up our hearts and open our eyes to this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, I, I read that to you because there's some information in here that I want to slow down on because I believe that there is a word for you this morning, a personal word to you from the Lord from these scriptures that you can apply. Now, even though this was written several thousand years ago, God is still doing the same thing today that he did back then. And he hasn't stopped. But here's the picture that you're going to see. And, and because the name uh, of the lesson today or the teaching today or the preaching today is theophany, theophany, which basically means this. It basically means the visible manifestation of deity. Jacob's theophany, where God wants to visit you today, right now, and he's still doing it. He's still doing that. He hasn't stopped doing that. And I want to show you in this story how that is still going on, and I want to show you the picture. So when Peter read that, John 1, and then verse 51 he says something to Nathaniel. What a beautiful, what a beautiful statement that he was making through Nathaniel. And you are the Nathaniels and the Natalines <laughs> of today. And that's still happening today. God is still doing those things. Now, I want you to get an understanding now. From here on out, from chapter 28 all the way to chapter 37, you're going to be getting this insight from Isaac and his sons. Isaac is going to eventually pass away. You're going to see this with Esau, and you're going to see it with Jacob. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jacob. And then you're going to get into chapter 37, where we at Isis have just had a great time in our men's ministry, where Joe, who's here today, this great teacher, was taking us through the life of Joseph, which was beautiful. But Joseph winds up being, obviously, one of Jacob's sons, okay? And Jacob eventually has 12 sons. They eventually become the 12 tribes of Israel. They wind up in Egypt. With a few hundred people, and the next thing you know, they grow to be 2.5 million people. And guess who comes to pull them out of there? His name is Moses. So here's this Jacob dude. Now, you, you, I'm getting ready to read some things about Jacob that I don't think you're going to appreciate. And yet, at the same time, God used this dude. God used him. Let me just read some things about Jacob so you'll know. Now, I'm going a little slow today, but I don't want you to miss this one because I want you to walk out of here this morning knowing one thing. God is working, and he is speaking, and he wants you to join him. You're going to leave out of here with that. Today, we got people in this room who've had that experience recently. <laughs> 
and God is still bringing deity to earth. Heaven is still coming to earth. It hasn't stopped. You have to ask yourself the question, why am I stopping it? What am I doing to clog up the drain? Because see, when you move that, heaven poof, comes to earth. It come. Peter talked about that in, 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 in Sunday school. Y'all need to get to Sunday school, man. I'm serious. Peter, Peter's doing a bang-up job there. So let me just read this to you. I, I'm reading this information that I got out of the Bible dictionary. Jacob's name, Rick talked about that last week. Jacob's name, uh, two weeks ago, means he that supplanted or follow after. He's the second son of Isaac and of Rebekah. Uh, a twin brother of Esau, Jacob appeared a short time after Esau, and it therefore was called the younger brother. They were twins. And Isaac was 60 some years old when Jacob and Esau was born. Jacob is an outstanding illustration of the, watch this, the presence of conflict of two natures within a believer. They call it Jekyll and Hyde. I don't know if you've ever been that way, okay? Jacob is good and bad. He rises and falls, yet in spite of his failures, watch this, he was a chosen instrument. I want to say this to you. In spite of your failures, you're still a chosen instrument. Isn't, isn't that fun? That don't mean you can go lag a gag and just do stuff and everything will be okay. Don't, just, just because God tolerates, just because God has patience, don't mean that he tolerates sin. Okay, I want you to know that. He's patient, but he doesn't tolerate sin. From anybody. And so Jacob was this up and down, Jekyll and Hyde dude, man. That's what he was. And you won't find the Greek word for dude in the Bible anywhere, okay? Now, Jacob's character then is full of, full of interest and difficult because it, 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 there's weakness and strength. He is not a life to be described by a single word. For example, Abraham, you know, the, 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 the faith of Abraham or, or the purity of Joseph. Jacob seems to have this many side life. He was a man of guile, yet a man of prayer. Inconsistencies were everywhere. His life began with a, with a prophetic revelation of God to his mother. But with Jacob's early years was what was a single mixture, watch this, of good and bad and mostly very bad. Jacob, okay? Jacob. Now that don't make you can continue to be bad and it's going to be okay. I'm just talking to telling you about the sovereign will of God. How, how God wants to get his purpose done sometimes irregardless of some of our Johnny's foolish mess. Because you know what? For some reason I grew up thinking I could help God. For some reason I grew up thinking I could improve on scripture. <laughs> I don't know where I got that from, but I did in the last several years, he has slapped me down, saying, brother, I don't need you at all, <laughs> at all. I don't need your opinion. I don't need your illustrations. I don't even need your jokes. See, I thought I needed to doctor it up to make the crowd feel good, but I was making God mad because I was trying to please the crowd instead of fearing God. Are you with me at all? Then here's a couple of three things, and then we'll get back to the word here. Jacob was the victim of his mother's partiality. Rebecca loved Jacob. That was in Genesis 25, 28. This fault must be kept in mind as we judge his character. Second of all, Jacob was selfish. When his brother came in from the fields, faint with hunger, okay, Jacob would not give him food without bargaining over it. I mean, what a selfish dude, okay? Yet this dude go on to have 12 sons, okay? Naturally crafty and deceitful. He violated his conscience when he allowed his mother to draw him away from the path of honor and integrity. Now this is Joseph, this is Jacob. And so as I begin to share with you these scriptures, I want you to understand, Jacob at some point was also called, watch this, Israel. Do you know that Israel became deceitful. Did you know that the nation of Israel became selfish? Same thing. I'm going to ask you a question. I already said yes to the Lord on this. There are times when Johnny Square is deceitful. 
There's times where Johnny Square is selfish. And if anybody in this room says if you've never been deceitful or selfish, I just want to say this to you, you're lying. Just, just want to be honest with you with love. Just want to sprinkle a little sugar in there. We all have this operating in us. It's a void. Now, the beauty of this whole thing, here's the beauty of it. When God created you, he left a void that only he could fill. I'm so glad I don't serve a stupid God. He knew exactly what he was doing. And what that did is that let me look at the old the men and women of the Old Testament as well as the new and found out, man, that we all fall short of the glory of God. All of us. That one scripture leveled the playing field for me growing up as a believer. Because I told you years ago, I heard a white gospel and I heard a black gospel. That one, that was only one gospel. All of us have seen purple, turquoise, <laughs> and we have fallen short. So if God can take a guy like Jacob and do what he did, how, and Jacob didn't have the spirit of God like you do. And if he can do that with Jacob, how much more he wants to do with you? See? I should have heard, amen. amen, mercy. Beautiful story in Genesis 28. But, but I wanted to set that up for you because I want you to understand who Jacob was. I want you to understand God can take a man like that who did not have to do what he did to get a birthright, who did not have to do what he did to get the blessing because God was going to give it to him anyway. But he felt like he needed to help God. He felt like God, nah, let me make this work. <laughs> he was born to supersede his brother. You think God took Esau and just kind of threw him out of the window? No. Esau's reaction wasn't good either. So the point is, if God has promised something to you, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to happen. Well, then why don't you let God bring it there? Instead of Johnny Squirrel stepping in and saying, God, I, I, God I, I, I can help you on this one. Uh, God, I'm a little bit more wiser than you on this one. You know what? The timing. See, all of a sudden, I'm going to force something on you that's not there. And I see many, many, many of young men, young women, I see many of leaders forcing things on God because they know he said something in a revelatory way, and now I'm going to force this. So Jacob help, helps me understand. Johnny, you know, you, man, you, you, you need to relax. Uh, you, you need to stop being anxious. You need to stop being worried about stuff. If God said this is going to happen, brother, it's going to happen. Uh, are are y'all with me so far? Because we, we're getting ready to, to dive into the lesson because I just wanted to tell you what it's saying first. And, and, and then I'm going to make a statement to you because I want to I wanna kind of give you the picture of what you need to be looking at here in just a moment. So let's look at that verse 1 through 9. See, because what, what, what you see here is that Jacob, when you look at this, you, you see that, that Jacob did this. I mean, uh, Isaac. Isaac what? Isaac called Jacob. Isaac blessed Jacob. And Isaac charged Jacob. And he charged him something concerning, watch this, the seriousness. And I'm going to say this real slow. The seriousness of marriage and the seriousness of marrying right because God is still doing the same thing he was doing back in Genesis 1 when he put man and woman together in Genesis 2 and in 3 and there was no extra baggage there was just man and woman there and guess what happened God says that's my model and so Abraham knows that model. Isaac knows that model. And what Isaac is doing is he's basically sharing that with Jacob. Marrying, right? Making sure that the bloodline is intact. I, I appreciate those men and women who hold themselves until the right thing. I appreciate those parents who get involved in their kids' marriages and who they marry 
because he's trying to say thing to Jacob here. He's trying to say, wait a minute, don't be go picking those Canaanite women because in there they do not serve a monolistic God. They serve a polynistic God, a multiple gods. Because see, if you waited here, you won't find one. Why? Because you'll die that way. You got to go jump over to even your own bloodline. And you got to go to your grandpa. And you got to go to your uncle. You got to find your cousin. See, that's how serious marriage is to God. And let me tell you something. Here's the sad thing. The church don't take marriage as serious as she used to. And we just need to own up to that one. But we just need to own up to it. That's all, you know, because I tell you something, there's something about the sanctity of sex. There's something about the sanctity of life, and then there's something about the sanctity of marriage. Now, I'm not saying that for you to feel guilty. I'm saying that because it's God's way. Now, you need to reconcile yourself to it. I don't know how many hits I've taken because a true stance to that. Don't play around with that. So what do you think Isaac is trying to tell Jacob? Stay in the bloodline, man. Take marriage seriously. That's all he's saying. All the way back to Genesis 3 to prove that. Now these boys get offline like everybody else. They start just grabbing wives like here and there. I had a young man uh, that I was discipling on CSU's football team a while back, and he was reading Old Testament. He says, man, these guys have all these wives, man. What? Now, did God approve of that? I said, let me say this to you. I said, what God allows doesn't meet your proofs. Okay. And, and I want you to understand that. And so, so right here, in, in, in the, in, and I'm not sitting up here talking about anybody's marriage. I'm talking about the law of God. And so that's what's happening here. And so he gets back to that, and, th and then he makes some statements here because, because he, he's saying something. Now, you, you're going to have to just write these scriptures down because I can't, I, I don't want to take too much time to drop into them. But, 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 but in Genesis 24, 3 and 4, Abraham wants Isaac to marry, right? I mean, uh, J Isaac wants Jacob to marry, right? Because Abraham wanted Isaac to do the same thing. And in Genesis 26, 3, 34, and 35, you know, it was Rebekah who, who, who told Isaac that this guy's, the daughters of these Canaanites, these people grieve me and have grieved us. I mean, you ought to dive into that and read it. And then when you, when you, when you, when you, you get in here to verse 27, you, you, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, chapter 27, 46, if you look at it right above chapter 28, verse 1, it says, and Rebecca said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? God takes marriage seriously. Seriously. So I want you to understand that. That, 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 that. That's what's being dealt with here. And then the next thing he says to them, the next thing he says to them, he, he, he says, look, and may, and may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of people. Now, what he's talking about here, he's talking about the sanctity, not only of marriage, but he's talking about a people that come from that marriage and a people that come from that marriage is a nation. And how many nations do you know today that are serving God that would even put God first in their constitution? It's only two. America and Israel. That's it. How many other nations you know on the planet that does that? 
And God wanted these people to be born and these people to be birthed because he wanted to make a nation unto himself, not because he had a problem. Well, he did. He, he, why? Because he wanted to take a nation to show the nations how God deal with a nation. He wanted to take a family so he could share to, to, to the world how God deals with family. He wanted to take a people so he could show the rest of the world how he deals with people. That's where the Jewish people were raised up. See, so I'm telling you something here that this word is saying. He's saying, then I, I, I want you to be blessed. I want you to be to multiply. And then he says something. He says, look, I then am saying to you, Isaac, saying to Jacob, guess what? I'm going to give you the blessings of Abraham. You want to know what the blessings of Abraham is? Why don't you turn with me to Genesis 17? Are, are y'all following me so far? Okay, because I'm going to run right through this because I still have some statements to make to you. I just got to show you what to say. Okay, for, well, so when you look at Genesis, the 17th chapter, okay, and you see what these blessings are. And here they are right here. Uh, you know, you start, you, you start with the first verse, and I'm just going to read it to you. Here, here's it go. Now, now, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will establish my covenant between uh, me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, uh, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I will make you, watch this, the father of a multitude of nations. Isaac is saying the same thing to his son. I got to say the same thing to my son that my dad said to me, that my mom said to me, that, that there's something that God gives a parent to pass on to a kid so that that kid can pass it on to their kids. Are y'all hearing me at all? Now that, you know, now that stopped in America. That stopped in America. And, but, but, but because what? He, it's the bloodline. Here, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Watch what he says. He says that no longer will your name be called Abraham, but your name will be called Abraham, and I will make you the father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you, watch this, exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations from you, and kings shall come from you. And I, you know, and, and Peter and I talked about this at, at, at lunch the other day. Do you know how much the Christian society has contributed not only to this nation, but to this world? We started hospitals, schools. I mean, it is a plethora of things that Christians have started that this nation has today. And the very school system that the Christians have started, which started from Sunday school, is this very nemesis now. And in a while, who do you think started all that stuff? Rescues, you know, food and getting people off the street, dealing with homeless, widows and all that. You know who started all that stuff? Christians, it's in their DNA. This is part of the blessings of Abraham. Because here's what it says. I will not only bless you, but the families of the world will be blessed by you. Now, do you know any other religion that says we're going to bless the whole world because we're blessed? You won't find it. Y'all hear me at all this morning. You will not find it. So, 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 so what I'm saying is, I, I, I just want to continue to read this. And he says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between you and me and your descendants and after, uh, and after you throughout their generation for the everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Now, I will give you, I will give to you and to your descendants after you. Watch this. Man. Possessions, <laughs> property. I tell you one thing I really appreciate about the Jewish world. I, there's a lot of Jews that I know personally. They're not hurting for cash because they know how to handle money. See, when you own something, there's, it's different. And God says, I gave that to you. I gave that to you so that you will lack nothing. 
Is America still the richest country in the nation? And the answer is no. We're practically owned by China. That trillion dollar debt, guess who we have to pay that to? See, we're getting things away. So I'm not beating, I'm not beating our country. I'm just telling you why this 28th chapter is so important. Because you see a picture of something. Now, that's just the first part. Now we're getting ready to get into the second part, okay? The second part is this. Because Jacob tells, get, receives from his dad what he's supposed to do. He gets it. Okay, Esau comes into the picture, sees what's going on, and basically realizes that his parents don't like these marriages that he's got. So he goes up and grabs a daughter of Ishmael, and all he's doing is playing into the very thing that, you know, Ishmael was about in the sense that Abraham had to send him away and separate him so that he could make sure that Isaac got what was necessary. So he goes and grabs a daughter of Ishmael. Didn't need to, but he felt bad. He felt guilty because his parents did not approve of how he married. And that's how Esau comes into the picture. You're going to hear more about him in just a, a few weeks because we've got to talk about him. But here's the second half of the story. Jacob leaves, and he goes on this journey, and he sleeps. And the reason why I wanted to tell you about the blessings of Abraham is because I want you to write down Galatians 3.14. When you read that, you will see Paul talking about what Jesus did so that the Gentiles, watch this, can get in, come on, of the blessings of Abraham. <laughs> yeah, see, you haven't been left out. Galatians 3.14, you got those blessings. Okay? Because of what Jesus did. Now, the second part is this now. He goes to sleep and he has a dream. A dream is nothing more than emotions and thoughts and feelings that come while you're sleeping. It's pictures. And on this dream, I want you to look at this. We're jumping right back to verse chapter 28. This is the second part. Hang, hang with me here because this is the part where I want to challenge you. Because it says in verse 12, and he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with the top reaching to the heaven, and behold, angels of God were ascending and descending. Now, let me say to you, that picture, descending and ascending, when the angels were descending, they were on, er they were on errands, angels on assignment. And when they were ascending, they were coming back to report what they were doing. Ladies and gentlemen, they're still doing that today. Angels on assignment. But let me show you what I mean. You, you, you heard what Peter read. Let's go back to John. Let's go back to John 51. And I want you to see how, how marvel Jesus was. Because if you go back to John 1, 51, are you with me so far? Because I'm in the second part. I'm getting ready to go to the third part. I'm not going to keep you here too long. But I want you to leave it out of here with these statements that I'm getting ready to make to you. But I got to lay the groundwork for it, okay? So, yeah, yeah okay, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, okay, all right, here we go, here we go. Am I on? Okay, here we go. Now, now, if you, if you, if you, if you look at John 1, okay, and you look at verse 51, maybe I'm talking too loud. I'm blowing the fuse out, okay? <laughs> Not, not a problem, but 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 this 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 beauty this this, this beauty, okay. So John, so 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 Nathaniel has this relationship with Christ, and Christ is calling his disciples, okay. And he starts with Philip, and, and then all of a sudden Philip meets Nathaniel, but Nathaniel comes from the same hometown that Andrew and Peter comes from. And, and as they begin to found each other, and it says, you know, uh, Philip found Nathaniel, and what happens is this. When Nathaniel comes to Jesus, this is beautiful. Jesus says, brother, I saw you up under the fig tree. I saw you up under the fig tree. I saw you. And look here, Nathaniel was blown away. You mean to tell me? That you saw me, brother, you are the king. 
You are it. Okay, now this is what he said. He says here in verse 49, he says, and he answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God, and you are the king of Israel. Now watch Jesus' response. I'm telling you something. He wants that same response from you. But here we go. Here we go because we got to go back. We got to go back to 28th in just a second. But I got to get this. And because I said to you that I saw you upon the fig tree, this is Jesus. Do you believe because I just said that? Look here. You can marvel God in one way. You know how you do it? You have faith. It's the only thing that pleases him. Nathaniel, you mean to tell me just because I said I saw you up under the tree, you call me king, you call me Lord. Now watch this statement because this is what I want to drive home to you today. Here's what he said. And he said, truly, solemnly, truly, 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 truly. You can believe it. You can go to the bank with it. He says, I say to you that you shall see, watch this, a heaven's open ladies and gentlemen heaven wants to open itself up to you every day hey come on every day and he says i want you to understand something maybe because he, he he wants to show you something here he he he, he said heaven's open watch this and the angels of god descending i'm sorry ascending and descending on what not the ladder that jacob was talking about because the ladder in the new testament is jesus himself uh, 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 did, did you grab that part so you get a picture in Genesis 28 of what Jesus is talking about, and he's just affirming the fact that I'm the one that the angels are going to be coming and going on, and when God sends these angels, he's going to send them on assignment. And you got them today. They're here, man, and they're working, and they're doing business. They are. They're real. And when they ascend, they're going back to report what they have done. And Jesus says, that's going to be, I'm the one that's going to be the king. I'm the one that's going to be the bridge. Watch this. I'm the one that's going to be the bridge between two realities. Here we go. Heaven and earth. Wow. I'm the bridge. You want to see heaven open? Get into me with me. You, 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 you want a piece of heaven? Come to know me. And I'll, I'll blow it wide open. And ladies and gentlemen, today, today, I'm getting ready to go to number three. I've already told you, number one, what they were doing, okay, what they were doing. Because I want you to go back now to uh, Genesis 28 before we do number three and we begin to close. That's my first clothing, okay, here we go. I'm getting, getting ready to shut this down, but I want you to get this, okay. Now watch what happens in Genesis 28th when he starts through verse 13 he says behold the lord stood above it the lord stood before it and said the same lord is the one that's talking to nathaniel in chapter one of john same god so 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 look here look here i i, I just want to say this to you before jesus came as a human being he was already with god in the beginning did y'all know that so, so let's just settle that one. Uh, uh, the only thing that happened is that he, his humanity was born. But, 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 but he was there. So, so the same Lord is sitting there looking at this thing, telling Jacob something. Now, don't forget, now, Jacob has these split personalities, okay? But he's saying, look, behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac. Now watch this. At some point, he's going to become the God of Jacob. This double-minded dude. Now, wouldn't it be nice if God comes to you and say that I'm the God of Abraham, the God God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and I'm the God of Eloise. Yeah, did y'all did hear that one? Yeah. I'm the God of Lee. I'm the God of Rick. 
That's who he is. You got to understand that he is not Jacob's God yet, and he is Jacob's God. But Jacob don't know that because God's got to do something with Jacob to will him back in for, for Jacob at some point to say, you are my God. Now, what has to happen to you? Do you have to be sick? Do you have to be in a hospital? Do you have to have an epiphany before you can say, he is my God? Because he wants you to have, just like Jacob, your theophany, theophany. He wants to manifest himself to you in the flesh while you're still alive. Because I say, God, I don't mind seeing you, but if I see you, God, please don't kill me. You know, because he had to touch this dude in the hip at some point. Okay. You can have that today, ladies and gentlemen. Today. And watch all this stuff. I'm getting ready to close this now because I got to get to number three. I got to get to number three. That's why I read the whole thing to you before I start piecing it out here so you at least get the, get, get the situation here. And he says, and here, here's, here's what he starts selling him. He said, your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth. Now, come on, God. Now he's ratifying the covenant. See, first of all, he says you're going to be like the stars in the sky. Then he says you're going to be like what the sands of the sea. Now you're going to be like the dust of the earth. My goodness. Wow. Wow. See, because children are God's inheritance. And, and watch this because I got, I, got I got to hurry him do this. I got to hurry him do this. I, I don't want to get sidetracked. He, he says, look. He says, and you shall spread out to the west, the east, the north, the south, and in you, your descendants shall be the families of the earth. You will be a blessing. You will be blessed so that you could be a blessing. We need to be blessing the world. We need to bless America. We, Christians, we. And I like what Peter said earlier. We can change it, but we can only do it one at a time. You know how we do it? Next door neighbor. That's it. Don't have to, you, don't, you don't have to go to Africa. Africa is sitting people here. Okay. Just go next door. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. And watch this. And behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. And I will not leave you until I've done what I promised. Think about that. God has promised something to you. That promise is still valid today. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I told you about a year ago when I told you about my mom telling me that, that she felt like I was going to be the one that, that God picked out of seven. See, I'm, I'm, I'm seven of seven. I'm the seventh son of seven boys. Okay. Yes, I am. And, and if my mom had told me, way beforehand I was going to be doing this, I probably would still be running. But she waited to six years after when she came to see the kids. She said, man, you're it. You're it. I'm telling you, you guys are it. There are promises. They're there. I, I, still, I still got one big statement to make. Okay. But, but I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get through this. So here then is the third part. Look at verse 18. So Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of it Bethel. However, previously the name of the city was loose. Then Jacob made a vow and saying, if, now, you know, you, you can't sit up here and make deals with God, but God allowed him to do that because God was going to what? Prove to him that he was his God. Prove to him that he was his God. Jacob comes in awe because the revelation, the revelation gave him a revelation. Why do you think you have the book? Of Revelation because Jesus see the name of the book of Revelation is called the revelation of Jesus Christ that's the last book of the Bible Jesus is still giving revelation today and he wants to give you a revelation 
Now, we're getting ready to set this up for you because this is how we're going to close this thing. I told you in the beginning, do you know that heaven can come to earth for you today? All you got to do is ask. That's all you got to do. God, will you reveal yourself to me? Why would not God Almighty make you play, let's make a deal? He's not that kind of God. All right, Johnny, we're going to give you three doors. The answer is behind one of them. If you don't get it right, you may end up with a donkey or a paid full trip to Hawaii. But it's in there. Now, that door is worth $5 billion. The other one, you got to go and pay something because you might wind up with a donkey. God doesn't play that kind of game. God says, I want to bring heaven to earth to you today. And all Jacob did was said, okay, God, if you're going to do that, I just want to make a quick deal with you. If you're going to take me on this journey, will you be with me? And God, will you bring me back safely? Because if you do, my response back to you is to give you a tenth of everything I got. Guess what? God fulfilled his promise. Now here is how we close this. Here is the statement. I want you to listen to it. I want you to listen to it. Through the sanctity of life, sex, and marriage, God sends the revelation through us to the world to stay on mission through the sanctity of life sex and marriage he carries it out and then he sends a message it's a revelatory message to you and to me that he wants the world to know that he's asked us to stay on mission marriage message Mission, mission. Now, here's your challenge. Your challenge is this. You are a part of a bloodline. There is a promise that you have because you're a part of a bloodline that God is passing the baton from your parents to you, and you pass it on to your kids. The second thing is, is that there's a blessing that comes with it. God is going to bless that, and he's blessing you right now. But here is the third thing. God wants you to have a Bethel just like Jacob did. You got a Bethel. My Bethel came a while back. My wife will contest to this. When she goes downstairs and she begins to vacuum my room downstairs, there's a rock right next to a window. That rock is a rock that I got from across the street. If any of you know where I stay, the bottom of the foothills right there on Overland is the back of my home. And something happened to me years ago. And I went and got a rock as a memorial. That rock represented pressure. That rock represented a rock that was there when God created the world. It's the same rock that was there before I was born. I took that rock, put it down into my basement. And most every single day, unless I'm out of town, I go to that rock because I remember the pressure I remember the heartache. I remember the blessings. And that's where I meet God every morning. That's my Bethel. Where is yours? And he opens up heaven for me almost every day. Because when I go down there, I remember it. I remember the good times, I remember the hard times, I remember the pressure times. And like Jacob, he got that rock. You know what he did? He poured all on it. You know what he's doing? Communion. Because in this place, God was here. And then he consecrated it. In this place, 
God is going to show up. And ladies and gentlemen, when I go down to that basement, it's a consecrated time. It's just me and him. It's just me and him. And he begins to speak to me. I begin to tell him. And I'm not pumping up Johnny. But I begin to tell him what I like and I don't like. He disciplines me there. We cry. I sing. I hurt. I worship there. Every day. I do it. That's my Bethel. And he wants to do that for you. He does. Yeah, I get a little emotional. You know why? Because I meet him there. I meet him there. And my mom said, hear it. Hear it. Pass it on to your kids. And God has given me a revelation for Jesus, for my family. It's real. And he wants me to stay on mission. And you can do the same. Because the marriage reflects principles. The principles. Okay? And the message keeps the portal open. And the mission keeps kindling the power. Because this, the bloodline, is God's heritage. The kids. The blessings is God's holiness. And the Bethel is God's house. Before you leave here today, I'm going to pray for you. Okay? I'm going to pray that you have your Bethel. I'm going to pray that you leave here today serious about having it opening up for you. Clyde gave me his testimony when he came in about something that happened to him. You ought to listen to it. He met God. He met something during the challenges. I'm going to pray for you today. I'm going to do that in just a second. Heavens open up for all of you when you leave here today, that you get your Bethel. And every time, every time you, you remember this, you're going to have a place. And you, you'll never forget it. I met him there. Father, I want to thank you. And we're going to be taking communion here in just a moment. But my prayer is to take the Lord's prayer, that portion that you said, <laughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What happens when heaven comes to earth? Jesus was so marveled by Nathaniel just basically saying, you saw me? You're the king. You're God. And Jesus says, you're going to see angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. That's what you showed Jacob. And that's what you're showing us today. My prayer is that heaven will come to earth for everybody in this room. That you will give them their Bethel. That you will give them the blessing. And that you would let it come through lineage. Through what has been handed down to them from their parents. Father, we ask that you will give us our theotrophy a manifestation of deity by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And Page 429. <clears throat> this is one, two, and five. Sweet.
sinners redeemed. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. When to do far beyond what we can even think of. He can even ask. He's the one that can bring heaven to earth. He's the one that want to meet with you personally. All you have to do is ask. His name is Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Go in grace. Did we say that? And go in peace. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. Please thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Have a great week, you guys.